Welcome to another edition of our interview series with our players here at WCF Symphony, The Musician Beat. And this is another very special episode where we're able to actually do our interview in person, distanced here on the stage, but still able to be together because we're actually together working on a concert um, that's going to be coming up here at the end of the week. Um, so I'd like to welcome a couple of our brass, I guess I should say brass and percussion ensemble musicians. We've got Val Shanley here from the horn section and uh, excited to have Mike Short who is our principal tuba player and we've got Alan Lawrence who's our timpanist and also doubling on some percussion for this show. So thrilled to have all three of you here and Val I'm going to turn it over to you. Just uh, for those out there who may not have ever had a chance to chat with you in person, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're up to these days. Sure. Well, I have played horn in the orchestra for a long time. I actually had the opportunity to start subbing in the horn section when I was in college here um, many years ago. So I've been playing in the orchestra for more than 20 years now. And in addition to playing horn here, uh, my full-time job is teaching middle school band and jazz band in the Cedar Rapids area. And I'm part of a musical family. My husband, Steve, uh, teaches music education and jazz band and orchestra at Coe College and also is the conductor of the Cedar Rapids Municipal Band. And we have two high school children that are very active in music. So there is music happening almost all the time in our house. You know, it actually sounds great that, uh, you know, during this time of pandemic, staying at home, you guys just have all kinds of music happening inside, which might be happening at ensembles and rehearsals elsewhere. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with the symphony. Well, uh, I've been principal tuba for the last 20 years here, but I got my bachelor's and master's degree here at the University of Northern Iowa, and in fact played for an entire season in, do I dare say it, 1976 to 77 as the bass trombonist of this orchestra. Um, I moved to Chicago for a while so I could study with the, the CSO tubist and came back to Iowa but settled in Des Moines and a few of the low brass players begged me to come up and, and play a few things for you and uh, I still make the trip, and it's it's always kind of a walk down memory lane because uh, I lived right across the street here for for a number of years. Now uh, I'm semi-retired. Um, I taught a lot at colleges in Central Iowa, uh, including Drake and Iowa State and and uh, Central College, but now I'm teaching students at home. Unfortunately, because of the, the pandemic, I'm, I'm down from about a dozen a week to two. And most of my playing has disappeared. Uh, I'm a regular in the uh, Des Moines Metro Opera, but we didn't have a season this summer. They did pay us uh, a good amount of, of what we would have gotten, but uh, most of my my playing this summer has been outdoor gigs. Uh, there's a klezmer band that I play with on occasion. Uh, we've had some brass quintet things, and including up here, uh, the beginning of September, uh, the uh, brass quintet from the symphony played a, a one-hour program, which was a lot of fun and a big relief because sitting at home and practicing a couple hours a day with nothing coming up is very hard to do. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's something that, uh, you know, sometimes folks don't think about that motivation and, and kind of, you know, having those goals and benchmarks that you set for yourself throughout the year. And we'll talk about that, you know, here in a minute, a little bit more. But um, Alan, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I've been playing in this orchestra. Uh, I started like like Val did as a substitute player in the mid 1990s so I guess for about 25 years and then in 2009 the position was officially open and I went through the audition process and and I've been playing here since then in this orchestra and usually in this seat I think is my wife Anita Tucker uh, is the concert master of the orchestra uh, we live in Cedar Rapids 
but uh, in, in a normal year, uh, it's always nice to come up here because quite often this is one of the times that we can actually sit and talk together and, and uh, have an easy time and not have a frantic schedule going on of some sort. Um, I'm a, a native of Texas who didn't know how to read a road map and uh, wound up uh, in Iowa, but, but it was sort of a full circle kind of thing. My father was actually born in Des Moines and uh, his family moved down to Texas early on. But uh, I was educated in Texas, taught school for a couple of years in Central Texas, went to graduate school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the University of New Mexico. And when I was finishing up there, I, I started really preparing for orchestral auditions, specifically on, on timpani, the kettle drums that are part of the percussion section, and yet it's a, a position uh, outside of the percussion. Uh, timpani had the longest history in a symphony orchestra of any of the percussion instruments. Uh, Haydn, Mozart, Bach, Handel, Beethoven, composers of that era really concentrated on timpani. And even through the 19th century, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, through Mahler, uh, there's not that much going on in the percussion until the 20th century. And then all of that stuff comes into play. But uh, timpani caught my ear early on and uh, that, that's the instrument that I wanted to play in an orchestra. So when I was finishing grad school and I got on the audition bus, and I think this was my fifth audition, I came to Cedar Rapids and auditioned for the orchestra there 32 years ago. And uh, started playing there and I taught middle school band for a while. I have great admiration for <laughs> Folks in that field, the heroes of the music field. Uh, but, but eventually I got to where I had enough private students and teaching at Coe College and Cornell College as well. Uh, that, that provides my, my living. And uh, the thing I think that really clinched it for me career-wise, uh, having this kind of varied career about 20 years ago, I was asked to start a New Horizons band in Cedar Rapids. I know there's one here in Waterloo. Uh, the second such band in the country is in Iowa City. And I think we were the 30th band. But anyway, it's a band program for uh, retirement age people. And we started with 11 people 20 years ago and we're at about 50, 55 right now. And uh, it just becomes something that these folks in their retirement really focus good attention on. Uh, they enjoy it musically and they enjoy it socially. Uh, I know there's old friendships that have been rekindled in my group as well as new friendships that have come along. So it's, it's just socially, uh, I didn't see it coming, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to be part of. It's so great to hear from each of you. And you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with you guys now for a decade or more, and I still learn new things every time, every time we get a chance to talk about this stuff, so I really appreciate that. And Alan, too, I mean, to have you here playing with a brass ensemble is kind of cool, but a, a lot of this brass music does, does feature um, percussion instruments, and so it's, it's a nice color that we are able to um, bring in here, as well as some of the original timpani parts from these pieces. Um, I did want to pivot, though, a little bit uh, uh, momentarily to talk specifically about what this pandemic period is like. Mike, you, you know, briefly spoke about it, but Alan, I'll just turn it back to you and, and, and give us an indication of all that teaching, your New Horizons activities, playing in the symphony. I mean, how's that been impacted by this whole situation? Well, this is my first playing gig, this set that we're doing right now since March 7th. Um, I have been teaching, uh, finished last academic year at both Co and Cornell with uh, Zoom lessons, uh, trying to get on top of the learning curve of that, and it's tricky. Um, the New Horizons band uh, that I've been part of, certainly we shut down like everybody else did. Uh, you know, it, it's very much what we're dealing with in this set of, of uh, players of wind instruments that involve 
dare I say it, spitting into their instruments and uh, pretty much in close quarters. Uh, so it, it's great to see how uh, through ingenuity and, and energy that, uh, that you all have come up with a way of getting people far enough apart and, and uh, able to carry on with what we do. With my New Horizons band at this point, we're, we're furloughed. It's a, uh, a group, you know, I'm, I'm the kid in the group and, and uh, still I wanna be as careful as possible. Um, it, it's just really something to look at the national and international picture and know that uh, as we are frustrated in not playing, that that's an industry-wide situation. Uh, the New York Philharmonic was the first to cancel up to January, and now I, I hear that they've canceled their whole season. Chicago is out till March, uh, and, and orchestras in Europe uh, dealing with the same thing. Uh, some of them dealing with it very creatively. There's a, a YouTube performance of the Beethoven Second Symphony first movement with the Philadelphia Orchestra and they must have gone to every player's home and the camera stays on whoever has the lead part at any point. The camera editing is just brilliant in that. Uh, and, and there's other performances of groups spread out far and wide on their stage. So, you know, people want this music to continue. Fortunately, not just the performers, but I think audiences are hungering for this art and we're all missing it very much and I hope there's an end to this tunnel. Yeah, I think uh, we all agree with that. And in fact, um, you're absolutely right about how um, this unevenness of the impact of the pandemic has you know, unfolded over time. So some industries are really impacted and others are not impacted quite as much. I mean, everybody's impacted to some degree, but it really has hit the performing arts hard. I want to extend the question though a little bit and, and Val, I'll ask you, um, you've got a couple of kids at home. You're also a teacher in, in the schools you know, here in the state. Um, so what additional things, you know, aside from, from maybe um, not playing as many gigs, what, what else has been the effect of this? What have you seen happening with like, technology in your home and, and all of these things surrounding what we do in music? Yeah, I, th I think one thing I've really noticed just in the last few weeks is the shift in mindset from getting through this to really trying to make some different kinds of plans for the future. You know, I think in the spring when things were starting to get canceled and there were concerts being canceled, um, I direct a middle school jazz camp in the Cedar Rapids area in the summer and when we had to make the decision to cancel that, and, and, and then the school year starting, um, the school I teach at was also very damaged from the derecho storm. So we started the year late and have been completely online and will be online till at least the middle of December. So I haven't seen any of my middle school students in person. And I think that, you know, making that shift from, oh, we just have to figure out how to kind of get by for a few weeks to knowing that, that this could be a really long-term thing and how our how are we going to make it exciting for students and for players? And, and I think the piece that, that I see across the board from, you know, my sixth grade beginning band students to the professionals is trying to come up with a way to make up for the social connections that, that we all miss so much. You know, the, the Cedar Rapids Municipal Band is, you know, yes, it's great to play in that group, but it's also, it's what we do all summer. I mean, we see all of those friends and musicians all summer long. We get together with them and missing that piece. And I think for, for kids, too, that, you know, maybe aren't going to go on to be professional musicians, what they love about band and orchestra is that being together and trying to, trying to find ways to do that, especially when you're trying to do it across a computer screen. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because to me, what's been so surprising about restarting our season with these virtual shows has just been the emotional weight of actually getting together again. And I wanted to turn, turn to you, Mike. You talked a little bit about some of the challenges that you've already seen with this pandemic, but you've also played some gigs. You did some outdoor work, um, as you mentioned, the brass quintet here. And tell us a little bit about, you know, obviously we've made some adjustments um, for this set from what we would normally do. You're back here playing. Give us a little bit of insight as, as a player into sort of what this whole thing feels like and what the experience is for you. 
Well, one of the strangest things that we noticed, or at least I noticed, um, when we did the brass quintet uh, at the beginning of September, I mean, we needed to be spaced out, you know, socially distanced. And in a brass quintet, we're used to being fairly close together. We rely more on visual cues than than we we even realize, because we look at a at a player as their entrance is coming up, or if we have to coordinate an entrance. Um, uh, Dan Malloy was was playing, and. I wasn't able to see him and keep the others in my view, and we we kind of messed up an entrance that that should have been would have been very easy, but like the distance between me and the the first trumpet was almost twenty feet, and when we ran through the rehearsal just to get used to the space. Um, he would say something and I could not hear him. Some of that is, is my, my hearing is as I advance in age. Too, too much, too much uh, hanging out in the brass section. Maybe he's, uh, right well, there's there he's is right next th to me too. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, and part of that is I almost hate to say it because it encourages you conductors, but you know, today was a, a much easier rehearsal for us because we've got that visual and rehearsing in the brass quintet was a challenge because of course we play without a conductor that's that's traditional um and i mean some of the jokes are, are that we don't watch conductors we do we just don't make a fetish of it uh, <laughs> But it's probably a good idea. Well, yeah, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But that's one of the challenges. I mean, social. It would. This is such a social thing, more of a social thing sometimes than we realize, because the relief of seeing these people that we're used to seeing many times during the year, and then all of a sudden for seven eight months we don't see each other we don't interact um you have to get used to the interactions too and when that goes away entirely i mean i i think i said it before but you know i sit down and try to put in two or three hours of practice every day but what am i practicing for and it's just me and I, I resist the technology a little bit. I mean, there's with the teaching, I did some Zoom uh, lessons and I did some FaceTime lessons. That can be very difficult because the, the uh, interaction all of a sudden stops and then runs ahead or runs behind. I can't tell whether my students are intentionally playing the rhythms wrong or what's happening. And then the sound. They don't even get me started on the sound. It, it, it doesn't sound like a tuba when it comes through a, a computer speaker. You're saying, you're saying Zoom is not tuba optimized yet, but maybe, maybe yet. one day we'll get there. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's why I've, I've now gone to live lessons. But when the, when the weather was good, we have an enclosed porch. We sat 12 feet away, and at least there was presence there. But, yeah, without that, I, I, I can't guide them very well. Well, it's, you know, it's, um, I think, really telling to, to kind of focus on, on that aspect of your work uh, because one of the things that we've wanted to do here, of course, is have concerts for audiences. But another huge part of what we're doing is to get ourselves all together to make music. I mean, this is part of our DNA. And, and wonder if you just talk about that briefly, Alan. You know, um, what we do is gather together with other people and make music together. We're all individual musicians, obviously, but I don't think any of us figures that what we really want is just to play alone and this is some step in that direction. Um, and so I think the hope here at the symphony is that um, this gives us an opportunity to, um, to explore the social side of music making, albeit with some changes. And I wonder how that's been for you this week, Alan. 
Uh, I, I'm enjoying this, you know, we, it, this is why we all uh, put this in the forefront of our careers and, and uh, we, we're all teachers of music, but we all want to perform as well. And, and uh, those two things feed each other usually, uh, but now they're both challenged in different ways. Uh, the group that I mentioned earlier that I work with, New Horizons Band in Cedar Rapids, uh, I know there's members of my group that uh, the badly want to get back to playing, you know. Uh, it, it's just something that they, they had invested a lot of energy that, that wasn't, uh, that didn't have career implications, but it, it becomes a very enjoyable hobby for these people. And the, the social side of it, for instance, uh, much like the municipal band in Cedar Rapids, when we get to our breaks, then a million conversations are going on and people catching up with each other. My group did have a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, and, and had a good turnout. I was glad to see so many people come for us to just talk about, you know, not only missing music, but, but world events, for those of us, Val and I live in Cedar Rapids and this derecho storm that came along on August 10th was just uh, something pretty devastating to our community that it's going to take a long time to get back from. So we're, we're trying to deal with both that and all of the, the care that we have to take every day to, during this pandemic. Uh, so it, it's a real, just uh, refocusing on on priorities in one's life. Yeah, no question, and and uh, you know it's something that has really I think been um, central for all of us. You know, to take a look at it. Val. You know, we're going to wrap it up with you. Um, what what would you kind of hope to see coming out of you know this experience, but more broadly, kind of our way forward in this time? I mean, you've thought a lot about this. You're a player. You're an educator. You have this musical family. What do you think about that? You know, I think I think one thing that has been a positive from this is that there has been time to do some types of playing and performing that we never feel like we have time to do. Um, this summer, we got a horn, just an area horn ensemble together in the summer and started meeting once a week outside. And we were actually meeting at Beaver Park, which is one of the places where the Cedar Rapids Band plays. And people started kind of showing up for our rehearsal and we you know we were trying not to publicize it because we didn't want to have a crowd but people were kind of like hey there's this horn group that's playing in the park and then we did a few sessions in Dan's front lawn and people would stop by and you know I haven't played horn ensemble music since I was in college and there just isn't an opportunity to do that so so that's been a very positive thing and I think even in the schools um you know, uh, our daughter is very active in both classical and jazz bass, and she had some time this summer to work a little bit with a, a really intense a jazz trio situation, which gave her all kinds of opportunities that you wouldn't have in a big band. And so I think that, that and what we're doing here with the chamber music, that's been really exciting to sort of, oh, this is music is so much fun to play. And we're always in that rush to move from symphony thing to symphony thing or this big concert to that big concert. And also the idea of just having time to play that's not necessarily driven toward a performance. And I think for, for the students too, you know, that's something we've, we've been working on is usually everything is, we're working on this for the concert. We're working on handout music for the concert. We're doing this for the, and we may not be able to have concerts this year. And so finding ways, like how can we make this fun to play together and have these opportunities with maybe it not being a performance as the last thing. And that's, that's been kind of exciting. Well, wow, it's just so great to hear all of these perspectives from each of you. And I really appreciate you doing this with us today. Um, even more so, I just appreciate being together on stage and making music again. So I wanna thank you very much for doing this interview and let our audience know out there that uh, coming up here on December 12th, we're gonna be featuring some of our 
uh, results of this week's work for, for our audience. We're really excited about that. So thanks to each of you. It's been a pleasure to chat, and we will see you on stage on Saturday night.